Galatians chapter 3, the first half. We started it last, or last time we met, and we're going to work on that. And we're going to just kind of, kind of look at what I would call appointments, how God has kind of appointed things through time and worked through time. If y'all will, before we start, remember the prayer request sheet. Remember to write down your prayer request and make sure it, it gets back to the back. So Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. We're going to dialogue a little bit, and then we'll keep moving on down. And then we'll eventually end up in Hebrews 11. Your outline is similar to last week. It's exactly like last time we met, actually, except I have gone ahead and added the chart to it so we can dialogue more than y'all looking up at the board and tracing it down. So... Galatians 3, 1 through 5. O oh, foolish Galatian, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before who I, whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain? if it be yet in vain. Verse 5. He, therefore, that ministered to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? I'm going to stop there in, in verse 5, and I'm going to work off verse 5 and go backwards. Paul is addressing the Galatians. We know one of his first missionary journeys was to the area of Galatia, and he addressed these people, he witnessed to them, he preached to these people. And as Romans 10 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Paul literally opened his mouth and shared the word of God. You did, at this time he hasn't written the book of Galatians. You have the Old Testament written in scroll form at this time. But the change that takes place with the gospel message is beginning to get written, and Paul is literally going and witnessing to these Galatians who were Gentiles. This is Gentile territory. He is witnessing to them, and people are getting saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul has left and gone on, continued on his journey. In the meantime, people have come in, and as we saw in chapter 2, there are Jews that have come in and are coming in and teaching works-based salvation. That, yes, it's Jesus, plus... They're trying to put them back under the law. And as we saw when Titus gets presented involved in this, um, and Timothy, we know through the book of Timothy, that one of the works is under circumcision, that the act of circumcision has to take place. You are not truly saved if you are not circumcised, is what they are saying. Or you are not truly saved if you are not following and abiding by the Ten Commandments. Or you are not truly saved if you're not going back under those ceremonial laws that God gave them in the Exodus. And there was a time that that is absolutely true. But the time of Galatians and the time of today, that is not true. That is not what salvation is based upon. And that's what we're going to look up on our chart. But these people have come in, and Paul is asking them five very specific questions about their salvations, that these people that were saved, most likely were saved by the blood of Jesus, are are faltering, are stepping back, are becoming on unsteady ground, adding faith or adding works to their faith. And that is taking somebody who's in the spirit and putting them in the flesh. And as we know that there's no good in the flesh, nothing good in the flesh, that it has to be by faith. And Paul is asking them some questions. So in verse 5 he says, He therefore that ministered to you the spirit, mine in my version Spirit was with a capital S. There is somebody there. It's either Paul that has been there preaching to them in the Spirit. If he's preaching in the Spirit, this is not a false prophet. This is a godly man that is truly teaching them true salvation. Or we could even spiritually apply that to Jesus, the life and testimony of Jesus that the 500 plus witnesses saw that they're coming and testifying upon that you can look at it there. And he is questioning, is this man, how is he doing these miracles and these works? Because we have already the discussion that took place in Acts with Simon the sorcerer. Remember, Simon was doing these works and miracles, but there was no spirit in it. And he went to Peter and he asked, how can I do what you're doing? I want to do more. And Simon was a sorcerer. He was obviously a, a worker of, of the demonic doing these miracles and these signs, but he wanted more. 
And Peter said, it comes by believing in Jesus Christ. And that's when Simon said, well, I don't, I don't really want that. You go on, you pray for me, and hopefully that will happen. And it didn't happen. Simon was a lost man. That is what is so dangerous when we get into the flesh and we base our decisions on feelings. Well, God told me, da 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 Well, I just feel like I need to do da 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 Well, you base it on that because there are plants or false prophets or a Simon, men that do work that can seem very godly. But when you peel back the layer, it is not from God at all. It is from Satan going on into the tribulational time. There is a man that is coming that will do signs and wonders and miracles, and he will not do it in the name of God. And it will deceive, as the book of Revelation tells us, the whole world. And that's why I discern those spirits. Discern those spirits. So as we work back, we've talked about vanity. It is the suffering you're doing in vanity. And we know in Galatians and even in times like today, and as we, we look over to the Sudanese woman that was in captivity due to her Christianity, that is your suffering based in vain? Is God just doing this in vain? There's no, there's no testimony to it. There's no witnessing to it. Is it just a God that wants to harm you? And as you go back, are you doing these spirits by the works of the law? Is the law, by doing the law, by keeping the Ten Commandments, is that how you receive the Holy Spirit? That's what Paul's asking them. Because somewhere are the way the people have gotten caught up in that. So the base, before we continue on, just two questions that everybody should answer, and particularly believers. And if you dialogue with enough people that claim to be believers, or maybe they are believers and they've gotten caught up like these Galatians, what are you basing your salvation on? Because what you are basing your salvation on, then you have to base your neighbor's salvation on. You cannot have two means to the throne. It's one and one only. He said, there's one way, I am the way, the truth, and the light. What else did he say about that road? That that road is very narrow. And it is very narrow. So when you hear somebody say, and Jeff literally had a religion professor at Baylor who said that my Muslim brother is a better Christian than I am. So if we step back and we dissect this, this was a religion professor at Baylor that stated this 20 plus years ago. Unfortunately, I, think, I don't think he got fired, but I don't know. I think age is taking care of him, <laughs> or life. I'm not sure. He might be in the seminary now, which is even scarier. But when you make that statement, you have to dissect, number one, what is that man basing his salvation on? What is he basing his eternity on? Because I promise you, the Muslim man is not basing his eternity and his salvation on the same thing. The question is, do you I think he was misspoken and, and just misjudged, used bad words? And we all slip up with the tongue. Um, Absolutely, but we have a very prominent pastor in the state, in the United States, in California, that is teaching that Christianity and Muslim go together as Chrislam and very similar. And ultimately, they do worship the same God, which is not true. Which is not true. Again, when you stand before the Lord, what are you counting on? As we go back to EE. When, when Jesus said, or when God says to you, why should I let you into heaven? And, and I know that's, that's not necessarily the picture we get of our judgment. But it's something to really ponder and to think about. If that's how it is, if when you come, everybody, all the billions of people that have ever lived, come before him and he says that to you, what do you say? Because there's only one answer. Because to his right hand sits who? Jesus. And when those believers are going to come through, I'm just, I'm just 
painting a picture here. Please go with me. He's the mediator that will stand up and say, that one's mine. That, one, that one's covered in my blood. Don't you see him? Come on in. And if it's not under that, just going back to that professor that said, my, my Muslim brother is a better believer than I am or a better Christian than I am. So when that Muslim man comes up, what, what's the question that's going to be asked him? Is it not going to be Jesus? Is that not the answer he has to give? And that's what's very dangerous. And it's very easy to slip into empathy for somebody or sympathy for somebody and want to believe that they are saved. And, and in their hearts of hearts, I know they are. And, and it's not our place to judge or to question. Our job is to go out and share it. Just as Romans says that faith comes by hearing, well, how else do they hear if we don't go out and share it? If preachers don't preach the gospel and in dialoguing woman to woman, we don't share. Or in a group like this, that that how else do they hear? Or reading the word by hearing. But you have to base, number one, you have to base what is your salvation based on because how you answer that question is how it should also be for everybody else that's ever lived. Not an act of superiority, not that I know more than you, but the fact that it was Jesus and Jesus alone. If I'm claiming it's Jesus, then it has to be Jesus for Miss Gwen too. Does that make sense? And that's very hard. And when you put family members in there that you love and they're saying something different, it's very easy to let compromise to come in there. But compromise, if you are not careful, will lead somebody to hell. And that's very, I, 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 that's, it's, it's gut-wrenching. But it is truthful. It is very truthful. Remember when Jesus said, you know, he's standing and he's giving an illustration and the people are saying, but I, I cast out demons in your name. I fed the poor in your name. I did this in, all the, in, in your name. And what does Jesus say to them? I never knew you. And going back full circle to what you said about the professor, was he saying just misspoken and, and the man's actions were more godly than the, the professor's behavior. I, I think... You know, you cannot base your salvation upon works. If we base our salvation upon works, particularly in America, there are two religions that based upon works alone, with the Mormon church and the Jehovah Witness church, they should be knocking down the doors of heaven. The problem is they've applied works to Jesus plus a lot of other stuff. But a Jehovah Witness's behavior, typically, I could say if we're going to rank behavior, you know, they're more godly than I am. The way they witness and they go door to door and they serve and they're so dedicated. The problem with that is their salvation, their eternity is based on them doing that. My eternity is not based on me going knocking on doors and witnessing to people. My rewards are, and that's between me and God, and if I want to stand before God and offer him very little, that's my choice and that will be my regret but my eternity is based upon Jesus and Jesus alone and that's when he talks about in 1 Corinthians 3 when he talks about that fire and that we stand on that foundation of Jesus and then upon that salvation you build wood, hay and stubble gold and silver and when we stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ and we take that wood, hay and stubble and that gold and silver and we throw it into the fire it's what's left is our reward and we do know wood, hay, and stubble will not survive a fire. But that gold and that silver will be refined. And there will be some reward out of that. So that's all, that's all Paul. Paul is getting them back to the basic. Getting them back to that skeleton that we talked about last time we met. The base of your salvation is Jesus and Jesus alone. And that you've miscalculated it and you're adding stuff to it. And why that is so dangerous is because, as he stated in earlier chapters... If you continue down this way, adding stuff to the gospel, you're going to kill the gospel. You will kill your message of the gospel. And you will lead people to hell if you are not careful. So any questions on verses 1 through 5? Any, any points y'all want to share? All right, let's keep going. I'm going to read 6. 
through 13, and then we'll start looking at the last part of our, of our outline. Verse 6, even as Abraham, so, so they've, Paul's asked them all these questions about faith. And remember, he is dealing with Gentiles, but Jews have come in and are tainting the message. Jews have come in. Now, there is a question, are these Jews believers or are these lost Jews? And I don't know. I don't know. I think you could have both. I think if you were a Jew and you had been practicing Jew, Judaism and your salvation is based upon the Day of Atonement and doing those sacrifices and following the laws, it would, be very, it would become baggage to you on the other side of salvation. And it would be very hard to, to let go. Um, I've had the blessing of growing up in a Christian home, getting saved at a young age. So that kind of baggage, I have plenty of baggage, but that is not one of the baggages I have. I understand if you come from, anybody from a Catholic background, if you come from a Catholic background, I would imagine it would be very difficult, some of those rituals and some of those requirements of going to confession and taking communion and how that is worked into your salvation, that would be very hard to, to let go and, and to understand the freedom that you have. But understand that's very parallel to what these Jews that have become believers, the, we just finished Yom Kippur, or the Jewish faith has just gone through Yom Kippur and they had their Day of Atonement just recently. And I'll never forget, the boys had a Jewish pediatrician in Georgia that we had a very wonderful relationship with. And I had gone to see him on Thursday, and they were starting the Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur, the next day. And I remember him saying, I was kind of dialoguing with him about it, just kind of getting the, trying to get the door open. And he said, yeah, that Day of Atonement is coming, and hopefully I'll get that stamp of approval. And I just thought, oh, Oh, how sad. And that's based, Jeff and I were just dialoguing about it, that Day of Atonement is based upon the previous year's behavior, not the next year. It's not a free stamp for the next year. It is based upon the past, how I lived last year. And this is a doctor, this is a a pediatrician doctor who, who helps the children, who helps babies, who has five children, who one daughter is over in Israel right now going to medical school. I mean, if anybody can get the stamp of approval for works, it's this man. But that stamp of approval is only good for that year. And now he's already having to work for the next year. And I just thought that baggage. And if he were to ever come out of Judaism and see the light and those scales fall from his eyes and realize who Jesus is and what Jesus was, the baggage he would carry... But God can work that out. God can, God can sever that and divide that, and God can free you. But that works only puts bondage on us. So as we get into verse 6, Paul is calling him out, and then he brings up, he says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying in thee shall all nations be blessed. And then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Verse 9. Verse 10. For as many are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that does them shall live in them. Verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangs on a tree. So in Galatians, you have these Judaizers in, verse two, in chapter 2 that have come in and are trying to put these Christians under the law. And Paul is going back to him and talking about what the law did. Why, what baggage, the curse is the word that Paul uses, the curse that the law puts you under. The law was given as a reflection to show a believer what you truly are. 
or to show a person, not necessarily a believer, but the law was given to literally get you to a point to say, I can't do it. I cannot keep all these ceremonies. I messed up here. I gave the wrong sacrifice here. I said that. I acted like that. And I didn't do the proper that cause and effect. Because I did that, I didn't do the proper ceremony. I'm, I'm in a mess. I've got to make it that whole year back to the Day of Atonement. And all it was doing was putting you under a curse. God gave the law in his perfect timing to lead those people so when Jesus showed up, it was so terribly evident it was Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, because only he kept the law perfectly because man could not do it. Man could not do it, was not doing it, and still even today cannot do it. And even later on in Galatians, it talks about the law being your schoolmaster. The law is you as the pupil, the school, the law is teaching you, teaching you, teaching you. Because you don't know. And that's why that law, my favorite point on the law is, as Moses went up to go get the law, what the people were doing at the bottom of that mountain had broken all ten before Moses could even get them down. And I mean, some of us have that whole, that, I mean, sometimes I can, I start the day, I get out of bed, and I've already messed up. Like, I got a whole 23 or more hours, God. <laughs> it's going to be a long day, isn't it? But that's where grace comes in. That's where grace obeys. So what Paul did is he addressed the law, but then he went back. He went back further than the law. He went back to Abraham. So now, if you'll look at your chart, and I began it, I think we stopped at Abraham and Sarah. I went ahead and drew it out. We put a big mark two-thirds down. Between the big mark and the very first mark, I had you put three tick marks. And between those marks, please know that these are not spaced based on time or years. They are just evenly spaced because to me that was the easiest way to do it. But this time period, these are not based on time periods. And God gives appointments. And an appointment, as I've already defined on your sheet, is just a fixed mutual agreement for a meeting or an engagement. Or you could also say dispensation. And the root word to dispensation is to dispense. It's how you distribute. If you go to a candy machine, put your money in and turn, it dispenses candy. And oftentimes if you have children and you give them that quarter and they put in that candy machine, sometimes one child gets more candy than the next one that comes up with the quarter and spends it and they get less because either there was leftover from the previous or the machine's empty or the machine's not working. So just kind of giving you, because sometimes a heated word is dispensation. But all dispense is is how it is distributed or provided. One of the best illustrations to look at this is children. I had a wise man come to me, and we were talking about raising kids, and he said, I've got, he had four children. He said his oldest girl never gave her a curfew because she was the type of person that was always going to be home 11 o'clock, didn't matter what the event was, didn't matter, she was going to be home at 11. He had another daughter that had to have an exact time down to the minute because she was going to push it every time. Same father, same children, loves them equally, is parenting both of them, but sometimes what you do for one, you do not do for the other because it doesn't click, it doesn't work. Jeff brings up a point, Jeff said, it's just like parenting again. You have rules when they're 15. The opposite sex being in the house, you do not go to the bedroom, you do not close the door with the opposite sex. It needs to be on the couch, dialoguing with family. But when they're 25 and they're married you would not keep that same rule that they cannot go to a bedroom with the opposite sex and close the door. Same. So you get where I'm going on dispensation. So as we go onto our chart, Paul brings up Abraham. And I put Abraham here, Abraham and Sarah. And we're going to work back 
Genesis is the beginning of creation, obviously. God is beginning a new work in Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we do not know how long a time period, but for some time, he began, we know seven days creation, but we do not know how long eventually when he created Adam and Eve and they were living in the garden. We do not know how long they lived in the garden. But for some time period, once the earth was created, the seven days of creation, the day of rest included in on that, Adam and Eve in the garden, husband and wife, it was a complete time of innocence. They were, they were naked, and they didn't know it. They were free to eat, except of one, one tree. Their job was to name the animals, take care of the earth, and then they were to multiply and replenish the earth. And we don't know how long that time of innocence is, and I don't know if you do, but I, I, I struggle with what that truly must have been like to live in a time of innocence. They had no knowledge of sin. No, everything was great. I don't know what that would be like. I, I guess they, no gallbladder trouble. So let me just speak, no knee replacement needed. You could eat whatever you wanted to and be free to eat whatever you wanted to. I, I just, I, I struggle with that. You didn't have to wear, didn't have to wear, what am I going to wear today? Is it iron? Do I look fat in this? <laughs> yes, so, you know, there's, there's just, I, and I don't, can, I just can't even imagine. I wish, I guess maybe I wouldn't function well today, but that is what everything we're dialoguing about. Hair was always beautiful. Hair must not have turned gray. You know, you weren't coloring your hair. You were still dealing with beautiful, healthy hair. No marks on your skin. It just was, you know, bumps and... It just was a, a time of innocence. Yes, ma'am. The minute they sinned and their eyes were opened, innocence is over. Because the response to their sin is they had to be kicked out. Okay, so going back to your Genesis. So they're in a time of innocence. The minute they fell, innocence is over. And they go into a time of consciousness. And that's what God was trying to protect them from. You do not... He was trying to protect them and guard them. And, and I'll, I'll just speak as a parent, one of the most difficult things, and I feel like that's all I do, is try to make my kids aware of what is going on around them. When they have a soccer coach that says something that you're like, what did he say? That's not okay. That's not okay to say. It's inappropriate. I, I you spend my whole time dealing in this time now of consciousness, of are you aware of what is going on around you? Because I don't think you are, because we don't live in innocence anymore. And as we see, it's just like that is just closing in. And, and we have to make these children, or even myself, more aware. I know plenty of adults, I know plenty of mamas that want to go back to this time of innocence and put their head in the sand, and have stayed comments of, I don't watch the news because I don't want to know what's going on in the world. I understand that, believe me, my heart gets that. But it's not fair to your children or your grandchildren to not train them up and to know what's going on in this world because it's the world that they will be facing. And it's hard. Yeah. And there's a time, now, there is a time to watch TV, and I've told you about my TV, love, and there is a time to turn off the TV. Sometimes you take in so much information, it does just as much harm as not taking in the information. You have to balance it. That's where the Holy Spirit comes into play. So, this time of innocence, they enter a time of consciousness. They get the curse put upon them, which is the curse that even exists today, that man is over woman, and we battle that, that the ground will no longer be subject to us in the sense that it would just freely produce and we can go partake of. But now you have to work the land. And as you heard Jeff talk about moles, you've got moles in the ground and bugs on your plants and you're trying to, to grow a fruit tree and it doesn't produce. 
everything produced in the garden. And now they had to work. And now they had to offer sacrifice. God kicked them out. He put those seraphim, and you had the act of worship. That is where the story of Cain and Abel comes in. They are in consciousness. Cain knew what he was doing. Abel knew what was going on. They had to come and freely worship. That offering was worship to him. Most likely it took place at the gate of the garden. It was a reminder because those are where those two seraphim stood. Most likely any time in Scripture where those two seraphim are, God is in the presence of them. Most likely that is where they had to come and worship. One of my thoughts, I cannot imagine. Could you imagine that first night Adam and Eve spent outside that garden? Huddled. Wouldn't you just be huddled at that gate as close as you could be? Because something, obviously, if we had to have the garden, then everything around the garden was not where you wanted to be. Because the garden was special and it was different. But they entered a time of consciousness. And we know we have time and generations, as we've talked about Cain and Abel. Enoch's mentioned there through Hebrews 11, as y'all read through Hebrews 11. Enoch's mentioned there. Enoch is a an example of a man that lived through this conscious time and did it pleasing to God. And God rewarded him beautifully for that by taking him up. But he was the only one that we have recorded. But you have, through that first couple of chapters in Genesis, you have those lists and those genealogies of who begat who begat who. And then you get to Noah. And however populated the earth was at this time with Noah, when God looked down, how many men did he find righteous? Just one. And he allowed Noah's wife and his children and his daughter-in-laws to come on that boat. And he flooded the whole earth. He destroyed it all. Instead of recreating Genesis 1, he's going to do something different. And he did recreate the earth in the sense of flooding it and starting over, but not by speaking and allowing light. But again, their job when they got off that boat was to do what? Multiply and replenish the earth. And they were to rule over the earth. You have a sense of government that is taking place in the sense of man is to rule. As you read in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 11, it says, by faith, Enoch, dun, dun, dun. by faith, Abel, and it gives a list. By faith, Noah. Through the whole beginning from Genesis all the way to today and what we know is still to come, faith is always applied. You have to have faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Sometimes, particularly here as we'll look with Noah, works is applied to that. If Noah had never built the boat, if he had never worked out that faith, if he had never added works to the faith. God told him, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I want you to do. Noah had the choice not to do it, just as you have the choice today. But because Noah had faith and he acted out on his faith and he built the boat, look how God spared him. I believe in all my heart, if Noah hadn't done it, God would have found a man. Either time would have gone on and God would have searched some other, another man's heart. But God always has a plan. There is always a remnant. But as we get through this time of consciousness, and we see Noah, Noah built the boat, he started, he landed, his three sons were to go out and multiply. We know they didn't. We know they stayed together. That's where we get the, the incident of the Tower of Babel. We know faith is still applied there. God is now, as he gets to Abraham and Sarah, as he gets to Abraham, Originally, but the promise is to both of them that they have the seed that is a blessing. But as we get to Abraham and Sarah, God is, okay, y'all are living in this time of consciousness. I flooded the earth. I cannot get y'all to continually to come to me and worship me and ask me questions and I will give you answers and I will help you. You won't do. He came and he would dwell with them. He spoke to Noah. He spoke to Adam and Eve. He spoke to Enoch. He spoke to Melchizedek. Is in there. He spoke to those people, and they still wouldn't have behaved. A majority, the great majority, were not following. Did not have the faith. So God gets to Abraham and Sarah, and He's going to do something different. He called Abraham out, and He said, "Through you and through your wife, I will create a nation." And instead of having man's government, he begins to work 
through God's government, and we know with the identity of Israel. So as Abraham and Sarah have a child, we know that Isaac's name and Jacob can also be synonymous with the name Israel. God is going to do something different through some people. And at that time, you separate Jew and Gentile. Before Abraham and Sarah, Noah, Adam and Eve, Enoch, everybody was a Gentile. There were no Jews. Everybody was a Gentile. Everybody was to act upon faith and do whatever God told them to do. Upon the calling out of Abraham and that circumcision set them apart. And now you have a difference between Jew and Gentile. Now the Gentiles could always become into the Jewish race or the Jewish faith. But the Jews at that time were not to go into the Gentiles. You get the picture of Joshua. Joshua and those men were going into Jericho. We are taking the promised land. Jericho has every right to come and be a part of us, but we are not going to be a part of Jericho. That's where you get the picture of Rahab and why her story is so sweet. You have a Gentile woman who realizes there is one true God, and it's the Jewish God. And she puts out that red cord, and it spares her life. And as you watch, she is in the genealogy in Matthew of Jesus. It was because of her that Boaz and Ruth have a child. She is the grandmother to Boaz. And then Boaz and Ruth eventually are the grandparents or great-grandparents to King David, to Jesse, his father. Amazing, amazing. But God begins to do something differently. So it is a time of faith, but there are works. Abraham had to be called out. Abraham had to leave. Abraham had to be circumcised. If he was not circumcised, God could not deal with him. You're not in obedience. I will do this, but you have responsibility to act in obedience to me. And we see through Noah the obedience. We see through Abraham and Sarah the act of obedience. And that child, which eventually, all the way down to Genesis 12, Back to Genesis 12 is the promise to you and I that God said, I'm going to work through, through a nation that will come from you and eventually will, will minister to the whole world. And that's where you get the verse, if they bless you, if a nation blesses you, Israel, I'm going to bless them. And if a nation curses you, I'm going to curse them. That's why you've heard Jeff preach why it is so important, the man we put in that office as president, their view on Israel is extremely important to our future as a country. And we know eventually through their genealogy, not only was that physically speaking on earth and with Israel, but spiritually speaking, the descendant here is really Jesus. Jesus comes through the Jewish race. So not only are they talking physical land, they're also talking spiritually through Jesus. We're building up to this. So faith is always applied, but there is works here. There were things Adam and Eve had to do. There were things Noah had to do to be, quote-unquote, saved or right with God. There are things Abraham and Sarah had to do to be right with God. So after Abraham and Sarah, we know that God had to send them into Egypt. We know God had to send them into Egypt Number one, for the famine, he led them there. They needed to multiply and become a nation, but also for their disobedience, because in that 400 years that they were in Egypt, they never cried out to God. As, as some of us are studying in Exodus together with Bible Study Fellowship, it took them 400-plus years of slavery before they finally cried out to God. And the interesting thing as I'm studying that is, all they had to do, God is waiting to help them. But he will not help them until they cry out. Is that not the perfect picture of salvation? Jesus has done it all. He is sitting here waiting. His hand is down. But you as a believer or as a lost person, until you put your hand up and take his hand and say, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, he has to wait. So he begins something with Moses. So Moses is your next mark. So he's going to do a new work with Moses. He's tried 
this, I tell you what to do. It is by faith. Everybody is acting on faith. But I'm going to tell you what to do, and you need to do it. And there were times Noah heard God, and there were times Noah was quiet. But when, Noah, when God spoke to Noah, Noah had to respond to it. And the same thing with Abraham and Sarah. When, when God told Abraham to go rescue Lot, Abraham needed to go rescue Lot. When God told Abraham to have a child with Sarah and Abraham stepped out on his own with Hagar, there was a big mess he had to go before God with and let God fix up. And God talked to Hagar and God took care of Hagar and he took care of Ishmael, but he also took care of Abraham and Sarah. But there were things they had to do. So then we get Israel down into Egypt 400 years They obviously not only did not cry out to God for 400 years, but had not worshipped God for 400 years. Because in Exodus, as as we're studying, in Exodus, originally the request was made, let me go out to the wilderness for three days. Let the Israelite people or the Hebrew people go out to to the wilderness for three days because we need to worship God. Because what they forgot to put in there was we haven't worshipped him in over 400 years. We've got some things we've got to get right with God because we have messed up. We have a, it's going to be a long prayer. I would imagine for three days that's all they would have done if that's how it had worked out was pray because they had not been praying. They had not been worshiping. And as he gets them out, as Moses leads them out of Egypt, understand these people had been under pagan Gentile rule for over 400 years. And as we talked about the baggage of Judaism, and as we talked about the baggage of Catholicism, could you imagine for 400 years the baggage these people had from Egypt that they were going to carry in to the promised land if God did not intervene and come up with something new? And if you've ever studied the, um, the Egyptian history or the Egyptian gods, I know in high school it was one of our our studies, one of our history classes we took, it's a, they had a God for everything. And they even believed in the afterlife with these gods. And if you looked, all of it was false religion, very demonic. But this is what these people, these people, the Hebrew people had not separated themselves. They had intermixed and mingled in with the Egyptians and were living the life of an Egyptian and doing all that pagan worship. And so as we get them out there, God's like, you know what, I can't take them into the promised land like this. So what does he give them? He gives them the law. And now they have to have faith, as Moses had faith, to do all the wonderful acts he did to get them out of Egypt and the faith that Moses displayed through the wilderness. But now the law is applied. And the law is applied for the next couple of thousand years until Jesus shows. This is what their salvation was based upon. It was based upon faith and works. That's why you have Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All the works that the Jewish people had to go under. Why? Because Jesus hasn't come yet. We are still building. Back in the time of Moses, you are still building up to Jesus. Once the law is applied and through this whole time you have atonement from God but you do not have propitiation. Atonement is I'm going to accept your sacrifice. I will accept it but I'm not going to replace it. Propitiation is completely replacing it. And that's when Jesus and Jesus alone can call himself the propitiation. When they took that sacrificial lamb and they slit his neck and the blood poured out, that blood was to cover my, and it was to substitute in, but I still had to make it the next year for that next sacrifice. When Jesus was the sacrificial lamb, he was the propitiation. He came in, and it's like he knocked me off and said, I'll take your place, Tracy. I will completely stand there for you. And the best part is it just covers me in salvation. So they put them under the law. This is what Paul is battling. And they're dealing with a couple of thousand years. This marker will be the birth of Jesus. We'll we'll pick this up next week, and this is what we'll finish. And then you have Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And we'll see how from here to this side, things change. Things change. The way God is going to dispense salvation 
based on your faith, changes from here to here. All right, we're out of time. Is there any questions real quick before we go on? All right, next week we will finish up Galatians 3 and we'll finish up our chart. Thank you all.